So the first one is a like a tip, like a light post problem, you know, or or a kitchen faucet. Uh, you have an L-shaped frame. It's being loaded uh, with a force here P and a force here R. Um, this one's not too hard. I think a good habit to get into as people doing structures um, should be to. And this, and this technique that I'm going to say will actually be really helpful um, when we start to do um, what's called the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Um, and it's basically just kind of sketch what you think the deformation is going to be. So it looks to me like both of these beams are going to bend and both of them might stretch a tiny bit. So I would say you'd expect something like this and like that. So I mentioned before that you could kind of solve to work with each one separately and then combine them. And what I mean by that is you could say if we call A, B, D, um, if we call the strain energy in BD, well, this one should have a stretching component because you're pulling on it with R. And should have a bending component because you're pushing on it with P. That's going to cause a moment. If you have trouble imagining, like, should this have stretching? Should it have just bending? Um, one kind of tip you can do is like, you talk. You talk about this a lot when you're when you have like a, a theory or a model. One thing to do is to try to take it to the extreme. What happens if some property in my model becomes infinitely blank? or nearly zero blank. What do I mean? I mean, all right, we're usually thinking of this as like a big metal frame. And so it's really hard to imagine what these forces are going to do to it. If you instead say, okay, I'm going to pretend that this part BD here is a rubber band. Well, then if it's a rubber band, you know pulling on it with R is going to cause some stretching. So if I make it a little bit stiffer, so it's maybe like something like a, a softer plastic, well, that R is going to cause it to stretch, but just a little bit more. So seeing it as like, a, okay, this is just a rubber band. I'm going to imagine that R is going to cause it to stretch. I think it's pretty straightforward to see that P is going to cause it to bend. And so you would say, okay, well, well, this thing is probably going to, this BD is probably going to stretch and bend. Similarly, you can kind of think of it here and say, okay, I've got a force P pushing down. What if I link A to B with like a blob of jello, something super squishy? Well, now if I push down and I have this big plate sitting on a bar of jello, as I push down on that, it kind of makes sense. I would expect it to compress a little bit. So again, A, B is also going to have some compression. And then this R here is a moment causing this thing to bend. So both of them should have stretching and bending. You're going to integrate between zero to B of R squared over 2EA, and then you have to have an M squared over 2EI, DX. M comes from statics. That's probably not too bad, but it might have required a little bit of a refresher. Remember that M is, is uh, the force times the X uh, so it's going to be P times X there. Your other one is going to look incredibly similar. So if you're going to integrate from zero to A, your compression is going to come from here. Again, you're going to have a moment here. Now this moment is the force times B plus R, which is acting a distance this way, R times X. So I'll write that one down because that one's probably less obvious. P times B, oh gosh, plus R X. That's pretty much it. Once you are here, you just need to to your total strain energy of your structure is the strain energy of its components. And 
you can find the deflection at point D in the vertical direction by differentiating it with the vertical force. And the, if you want, you can find the deflection, oh gosh, in the horizontal direction. Nope, sorry, at point D in the horizontal direction by differentiating it with respect to R. The first part should, probably shouldn't have been too bad. The second part is possibly a little conceptually tricky because you kind of know it's going to bend because of the force being applied at D. You're asked to find the rotation here. So that force is causing it to bend. But what makes it tricky is that that force is, is a shear force. It's not a moment. And Castigliano's theorem requires us to have a moment where we want to calculate the angle. So you have to add a fictitious moment here. I'll call it C. Now your everything here is the same except you have your moments are a little bit different. So if this moment was initially PX and this one was PB plus RX, now for both of these, you have to add C because we have a new, we have a couple there. And once you've done that, the angle of rotation at D is found by taking partial derivative of your strategy with respect to your couple and then setting your couple equal to zero. Mathematically, the notation there is, is like saying, take this derivative and then evaluate it at C is equal to zero. So you might, you know, you could write it like this. That means evaluate that thing at C equals zero. So it kind of means do this derivative, evaluate it at C is equal to zero. You don't have to use that notation, but that's just a simple way of writing. And you should be able to find your angle that way. Um, 10, two, sorry, nope, not 10, two, 10, three. I think was probably the easiest of them all. Um, the only trick to this problem was recognizing that I depended on X, which is the first time that we've actually had to keep I inside the integral in which we integrate over DX. Not both I's, we only know I1. I2 was some constant. We don't know what it is, pull it out of the integral, it's gonna be in our solution. So the one trick is I1 has to be inside the integral. And the second trick is, well, not really that hard. It's just statics. Just knowing that your moment is P, oops, ah. your moment is your force times 2A minus X. And you can recall that our deflection can be found by taking M over EI as the partial derivative of M with respect to DP. So in that case, you could find that thing. It's pretty straightforward. DM DP is just 2A minus X and then you're done. So not bad, right? Um, let's see, what's the next one? The frame, I think this one is, was probably annoying, but I would argue that that's not my fault. You can blame statics. This one, you had to do method of sections to calculate all the various moments, right? We had a frame that looks like this, where the end on the bottom right was on a roller, I think. And we had a force here, and you're asked to find the deflection of this point. So clearly there's no, no force there. You're gonna have to add a force. It can't move vertically. You're asked, I think you're asked for the horizontal deflection. So you add a fictitious force. What do we call it? Q. And then you're, honestly, the real trouble with this problem is you have to first calculate the moment here, 
the moment here, kind of slicing just to the right of F. Kind of coming back over here, slicing just to the left, oops, just to the left of X and going to the other part of the beam. And then finally, oops, kind of getting the moment of that section there. I think honestly the hardest part here was probably just getting the moments right. Once you had the moments right and you knew to add Q, this one shouldn't be too bad. Um, but that should be pretty much it for that one. 10.12 I think kind of looks scary because it's a real structure. It's, um, what is it? It's like a cantilever that's pinned. And then that's pinned down here. So something like that. Pardon my drawing. You pull on it with a force. Was it P or F? P. And let me write down some stuff here. So we'll say this is A, B, C, and D. This one again, thought, excuse me, thought experiment, I think can help in which, okay, if this link B to C here is a rubber band, pretty clearly as I pull down P, it's going to stretch. I think the trickier things are the fact that these other two horizontal links are going to stretch a little bit too, because if you pull down on them, like imagine this. Oops, I should do it over here. Imagine this bar here. If I pull down on it, oops. We know those lengths can't be the same. It's a triangle, right? If this length is one, one thing, we pull down on it here, the hypotenuse, this thing is gonna have to stretch a little bit unless we allow this thing to kind of slide. Same is true up here. This one should stretch a little bit, stretch a little bit, stretch a little bit. And I think it's probably obvious to everyone, I hope, that uh, AB is going to bend. So the tricky one with this one is that your strain energy of this structure is going to consist of, if you integrate from A to B, which I'm not, it's like zero to two L, I think. Um, you get, it's going to be like a, whatever the force in AB is, you can get that from kind of a, a method of joints, right? Because these are all pinned to each other. So you can kind of do your triangles to figure out what component of this vertical force P is acting on these various cantilevers. That's squared over 2EA plus whatever your moment in AB squared is over 2EI. You could do this again, integrate for BC and CD. And then these ones are, are there, there's really, there can be no bending here. Why do you know there can be no bending? There can be no bending because these things are pinned together. So the reason why things are gonna bend is because there's some reaction moment preventing this thing from just rotating. Like that's what bending is. Think about this top one. You're pulling down here. There's a reaction moment at this wall that's preventing this thing from freely rotating. If it can't freely rotate and there's a moment, it has to bend. But these two can freely rotate, and so they're just going to rotate. There's going to be no bending there. So C and D are just going to have whatever the force in B and C is over 2EA. Oops dx plus whatever the force in c and oh gosh c and d is squared over 2ea and then you're just left with figuring out the deflection at d at c by taking the force derivative of that whole thing with respect to your force p and it might not be obvious the way i've written it down but it but it probably is after you've done all this is that 
um, these things are functions of p, right? They're going to be some fra some numerical fraction of p times of uh, some geometry, and then this thing is going to be like some fraction of p times x because it's a force acting over here. Here, my primary concern, you're all seniors in engineering, you're going to be engineers. I, as you will probably gather throughout the rest of this course, am not um, here to kind of uh, make grades some sort of competition that you need to strive for. I want you to actually learn this stuff and build things that won't break when I use them. So uh, if you would like, I will give you the opportunity if you did something wrong and you now realize that, you can submit your corrected homework by the end of the day tomorrow. So before the weekend, if you want, fix what you did. I'm more interested in you getting this stuff right and learning this stuff. So um, you can take another stab at anything you got wrong. And we'll go from there. All right, that's the homework. It's my crash course. I didn't give you everything. You still gotta do some work but hopefully it cleared up any questions. And if not, take another stab at it and um, I'll look at that as your, as your submitted assignment. Okay. How do I want to do this? Should we dive into... I want to first show you Mathematica quickly and then tell you why we're doing it. I'm not really sure if that's the best. I could do the math first and then be like, let's use Mathematica. But um, let me first give you a kind of a crash course in, in how to use this. So if you have downloaded it um, and installed it, open it up. Uh, if you want and you're able to download the file I sent, open that up. Uh, if not, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think you could come back and watch this video later if you haven't installed it yet. Um, uh, and you don't need to have the Mathematica file I sent you. It just might help as you're following along. Um, so let me share my screen. All right. So this is Mathematica. The files are called notebooks. They have extensions .nb for notebook. Um, you can stylize stuff, make things look pretty. So this is just text, this is just text, this is just text. Mathematica, what is it good for? It is primarily for, the, the, for uh, our purposes in this class, Fantastic at two things. Uh, one is symbolic manipulation. That means anything that you can do with math, adding, subtracting, uh, factoring, simplifying equations, um, doing calculus, doing um, uh, matrixes, matrix transformations, vectors, um, solving equations like I need to solve a system of seven equations with seven unknowns. Like you can do that by hand, but it's 2021. You shouldn't. Um, that is what Mathematica is good for. That's one of it. The second thing is it's super easy to graph stuff. Um, and you know more lin space x from blah, blah, blah. Like just, I want to plot x squared. You just tell it to plot x squared. Those are the two things that Mathematica is excellent at. Mathematica's drawbacks is that its syntax is weird. And, it, and so I spend a lot of time Googling while doing it or, ask, or looking for help to figure out how to do what I want to do. Um, but I think for the purposes of what we're doing here, I, I can hopefully convey to you the weird things that you need to know and you can try to ignore all the weird syntax things that you don't. The way Mathematica works is, um, you can start typing. Hopefully you have some text show up on one of these bars. 
If you want to do some basic math, you can, um, I'll open up this one. So this is basic arithmetic. You use the combination of shift and enter to evaluate something. So if I, I want to type in uh, 47.8 plus 67.43, hit shift enter and it does the math for me. Um, multiplication is you can either use an asterisk or just literally a space. So you could say 18.4 ah, 18.4 times 72.6. All I do is put a space between them <clears throat> and then it does that multiplication. And that's the same as putting an asterisk between them. You should type in some stuff yourselves and just see uh, if this is making sense. Division, you have two options as well. You can either use your slash symbol. So you can either use um, uh, one third. It's going to give you one third. Or one, and then if you hit control slash, it makes a nice little fraction. So your equations can start to look like they might look on your notebook. You'll notice that Mathematica is not going to um, approximate things unless you force it to. What I mean by that is one third cannot be written as a number. It can only be written as an approximation of a number, 0.33333. Mathematica is going to keep it as this representation unless you tell it, like, hey, I really need to know what that number is. Like, I don't care if it's an approximation. And then you hit it, you can, you can use this N, capital N, tells you what the number. There's two ways to use it. And we'll go through that in a minute. You can either tell it, this is basically saying like, after you do the math, run this function, which is the function is a, give me a number function. Or you can, or, and I'll explain what this notation is in a second. You can wrap it in that thing. Don't worry about it for now. We'll go through that in like two seconds. But that's, I just wanted to point out that it's not going to give you a number unless you ask for it because it's an approximation. It'll hold everything without approximations as long as it can. So math is pretty straightforward. Um, the reason why the syntax is strange in Mathematica is because it's what's called a functional programming language. Not functional like useful, but functional like everything is functions and your your job is to kind of like figure out what function you need to do various things. Sometimes those functions are like legit mathematical functions like sine of x is a function and sometimes they're uh, like plot is a function too which is not a mathematical thing it's just a but um, that's the way Mathematica works and this is where most of the headaches come from so I'll try to relieve those headaches. Uh, any Mathematica, the your choice of parentheses and brackets is really important. There are three. Square brackets can only be used for a function. So if I want to take the sign of a number, I think cap and and all of Mathematica's built-in functions start with a capital letter. So that's two things: capital letter and a square bracket. So if I want to find the sine of pi over two, I write capital sine, square brackets, the thing I want to find. Same with, so there's square root here. Uh, there's other functions too that are not really mathematical functions like random. Random will give you a random number somewhere between zero and one. Um, N, we already talked about, N is a, a function that just says, give me the number of this thing. So for instance, if you want to know the number of pi, well, pi in mathematical world is just this Greek symbol pi. But you might want an approximation for pi. So if you want a 30 digit approximation, you can write N comma pi comma 30, I'm sorry, N pi comma 30, and it'll give it to you for 30 decimal places. You can get it for whatever you want. Um, I don't, I don't, that just would be fun, I guess. Um, if you see this thing, which is your semicolon, that's basically your way of telling Mathematica to do something, but don't show you the answer. 
uh, you'll see why that can be useful for certain calculations if you don't need it to spit out every little bit. Um, some other functions that are useful when you're starting to play with stuff is if you if you define something as a variable, you might want to clear that variable. So to do that, you use clear, capital clear. So if I write like um, v is equal to 87, and now I type v, it gives me 87. But now if I go down here and I clear v, 87. Some weird things. Say if you're over here and you're like, I want to run that n pi thing again. How do I get to it? Look on the right hand side of your screen. There are these strange brackets. What you want to do is kind of click the thing that you're after and run it. You can click up here. You can probably barely see what I'm clicking, but it's over the side over here. Your other option is just to kind of use the up and down arrows. And once your text cursor is blinking next to what you want to run, you can run that as well. Um, if you want to delete stuff, you can kind of highlight your whole column. Let's see what I want to delete. I'll delete this one. And then I can just hit delete, like on my keyboard. Um, oh yeah, again, symbolic manipulation. Like right, what I mean by that is inputting equations that look like the equations on your pen and paper. Well, to do that, you want to be able to use Greek symbols. To use Greek symbols, Try this out yourself. Pick your favorite Greek symbol. Go to go to an open thing. Type escape, and then type whatever you want. I'll go with gamma. You don't have to type the whole word out. Once it's got only one there, you can hit escape again. Oops, no. I guess you do have to type the whole word out. There you go. And and then it turns to your Greek letter gamma. And these are all all usable. You know, uh, phi. Uh, escape, uh, row, escape, um, don't worry about this one, this is, could, might appear later, but, um, I don't think it'll matter, don't worry about these two either, okay. That's good for that. You can work through some of this if you want. I think it's a decent resource. Um, the one of the so if the first thing that's confusing about Mathematica is um, the function calls where you're like looking for a capital letter and a square bracket. You can only use square brackets for functions. The second thing that's confusing about Mathematica is it gives you everything in a list, which at first is really annoying, but it, later on it makes it really nice to work with um, uh, com like complex solutions and uh, like vectors and matrices because it treats vectors and matrices like lists and that's really it's basically built right in so you don't need to do anything fancy. So it's everything's a list and lists are that's what I was saying before. The braces that you use, the brackets and parentheses that you use are important. Square brackets for functions, curly braces are for lists. So if you want to write a vector, V, having components of X, Y, and Z, of what I wrote there, you would write V equals curly braces and then your vector components. So you can try this out. Now I have a vector V that has X, Y, and Z if I want components. I can do stuff to that vector. I can square that vector. I could take the square root of that vector. I could add another vector to that vector. Um, if I want to say only get the Y component of that vector, I can write, and this is the notation that I think troubles people most, is I write this double square bracket. You're, and I don't really know why. But that's what you write. So you write double square bracket and then whatever item you want. If you want number one, it'll tell you one, two, and three. You'll see in a minute that this 
there's like an annoying thing when it solves equations that you'll have to use this for. So we'll I'll talk about that in a second. I think another thing that's really powerful is you can really easily input matrices. So matrices are just nested lists. So this is a list. And I put another comma to get another row. And I have another row. And so my tensor T looks like this. But what's really cool is that you can take your tensor and say, hey, show that to me looking like a matrix. And And so you can actually like look at matrices like they look like on your pen and paper um, directly in, in Mathematica, which I think is really powerful as you're doing kind of the more, the second half of this course we, have, we do a bunch with like stress tensors and strain tensors and it's nicer to see them looking like tensors somewhere. Where this stuff is really useful is for you primarily right now is for calculus and solving equations. So calculus, straightforward. The function, to take a derivative. Um, the to take a derivative, the function you call is capital D. So derivative of f of x with respect to x. So I haven't defined f of x. So let's say the f of x um, this is how you define a function. I think I skipped this one before. I shouldn't have. What should I do? Like x squared plus 2x minus x to the minus 1. So I've got some arbitrary function here. The notation, you can read the notation as follows. f is a function of x. The little underscore there is is the way you tell Mathematica like, hey, look for x on the right-hand side of my equation. And then you write equals. One equal sign is like I'm defining or I'm, it's kind of like my Mat MATLAB too. Like one equal sign means like assign this thing to this. Two equal signs means equate these two things. Like this side of my equation is equal to this side of my equation. So there's my function f of x. Shift enter, looks like that. I can easily take the derivative of that function with respect to x. I can take the second derivative of that function. There's two ways to take the second derivative. Actually, there's a bunch of ways to take the second derivative. If you want your math to look even more like the math you're doing on pen and paper, you can just write f prime of x, right? f prime being the ordinary derivative. That does the same thing. If I want to take the second derivative, you can either wrap it in another D, or just write F double prime of X. And third derivative, F triple prime of X, and so on and so on until you run out of room for apostrophes. Um, again, I'm, I'm trying to highlight kind of how nice it is to do math on a your computer that looks like the math on your notebook. Um, again, you could do the opposite. Uh, to integrate, you use integrate. This is a indefinite integral because I'm just saying integrate with respect to x. So it's actually, I think, technically an antiderivative because it doesn't give you the constant of integration. You can get the constant of integration um, We'll, we can we can talk about that as it comes up, um, but you can also do uh, definite integrals by just giving some bounds. So integrate from x to zero to one. Oh, I picked a bad function of that because you can't have sorry uh, zero to a. That doesn't work. I always get the problem. A equals to b. Sorry, I picked a bad function that's undefined at at zero. Um, so let me do a different one, one that doesn't have this term in it. There we go. Let's try this one out. 
not pick a function that's undefined where I'm trying to integrate. But yeah, so definite integral, indefinite integrals. All right. And the last two things that I think are really powerful are solving equations. Again, to set an equality instead of assigning something, it's double equal sign. So I could say 3x squared equals a. And if I want to solve 3x squared equals a for x, then I just write solve 3x squared equals a for x. And here's where the output is a little weird, right? It says, first things first, it's a quadratic function, so you expect two solutions. So Mathematica is going to give you two solutions, and it's going to give you them in a list. Solution one, solution two. The second thing that's weird is it, is it says, uh, it gives you an arrow. What does that arrow mean? It means if you replace x with the stuff on the right, this equality will be true. That's a kind of an annoying way to do it. If you just want to access the second one, because you're like, oh, I know it's, I need the positive solution, then you can hit this second one. Right? It's the same way as before when we access the second item of the list. Does it always like do the negative solution first? Or like, how do we know that it's going to be a second? I think it's random. I, I, I'm not, that's a good question. I think it's random, but I'm not positive. So you have to look at it and then usually what happens, you know, if we're, if we're solving polynomial equations, usually what happens is you're looking for like the one real root. And so usually you kind of look at them and you're like, all right, these four have I, this fifth one doesn't have I, give me the, that one. I usually, you usually have to kind of inspect. This thing's still kind of annoying because it's got a curly brace on it. How do you get rid of that? Well, that's actually a list because it's got curly braces around it. And so there's only one entry in that list. So you could say, okay, I actually give me also the first entry in that list. And that's that. And the last thing that's annoying about it is you kind of just want the thing on the right hand side. You don't really want X arrow that. And so to do that, uh, then, and this is where I said notation can be annoying, is you use, I want to find x, and I want to replace x with what you're giving me. So you use this combination of stuff here, slash dot. That means, um, I think that means replace. I think it means, I think it means replace. It doesn't matter exactly what it means. If you do x slash dot that, you get what you actually wanted, which is the thing, the stuff, the uh, stuff on the right hand side of the equation. If you want the negative solution, you just change this to a one. You're good. You can very fast and easily solve systems of equations. So this is just um, two equations, x plus two y equals five. And then this thing, two equations, two unknowns. So you give it, look at the notation here, it's still solve, but you give it a list of things you're trying to solve. If you have a list of equations, you give it a list of two or three or four or five. And to solve anything, you need to have the same number of unknowns as you have equations. So you give it a list of your unknowns. So you're gonna solve this list of equations for this list of unknowns, and it spits out your answer. You can go further, you can say, I actually don't want to answer. You can add a, a third equation in which you have z in there, and z is a part of these unknowns, and solve for uh, all three of them. Um, I won't worry about these other ones right now. These how to solve differential equations. Um, I don't know if that'll be, I guess it might be a useful. So I'll just point it out really quickly. We'll skip the find root. Um, because we'll talk about that in a minute anyway. So here's a way to solve a, a algebraic equation, you use capital solve. To solve a differential equation, you use D solve, like differential solve. And to Mathematica, what I'm highlighting, it's 
uh, solving a, this is an ordinary different differential equation, right? This is y double prime of x, y prime of x, 2y of x equals 0. I just made it up. It's a differential equation. But to Mathematica, it's just an equation. It doesn't really care. So you just give it your list of equations. Here you have three equations. You have your governing equation and your two boundary conditions because it's the second order ODE. And you say, I want to solve these three equations for the function y of x and the independent variable x, and it solves it. And it's a horrendous looking thing. But you didn't have to do it by hand, so that's better. Um, we can dive into this more if it's useful, um, which it will be later. So I'll have notebooks that you use this a little bit. Um, but for right now, D solves how you solve differential equations. Get this other stuff. The last thing I want to show you is how easy it is to plot. So if I want to plot the sine of x for x from 0 to 2 pi, you just literally tell it plot that thing. Um, it's really simple to plot multiple curves on the same graph. Um, it's really simple to start making these things like, oh, the integral into that is going to be whatever the area of the shaded region is. I can, uh, I can make my curves look nice. These are all just various plotting examples, log log plots, 3D plots. You can plot data either, an either manually entering it by hand or you can read in CSV files like you would like uh, from Mat MATLAB. Um, and plot your data. You can do, I'm going faster here because you can play with this if you want, but it's not crucial for what we're doing today. Um, uh, you can plot this thing as data. You can fit linear regressions to your, to your curves. Like it's remarkably powerful. You can make things look nice. And the benefit of the functional programming is not something you can probably pick up on until you mess with this for a long time, but you can generate like responsive solutions. So I'll just show you a few things. This is just to kind of show off what you can do. I can create little sliders that um, uh, change a number as I move where I am on my curve. And I can use that to say, hey, let's make a plot of sine n of x in which I want to see how this curve looks as I vary n. And I can just sit here and have a curve that can adapt on the fly, which is pretty powerful because you can really start to play with multiple functions. This is sine of n x plus sine of n 2 x. And then I got some things to make it look nice. You can really start to see how the various parameters in your function make things look. This is not something I need you to know. It's more something I want you to be aware of. Like there's an absolutely immense amount of stuff you can do here that's, um, like I said, kind of complementary to what you can do in MATLAB. The symbolic manipulation calculating derivatives and integrating solving equations. I think it's probably the most powerful aspect of it for you at this point, probably plotting being the second most. Um, I, if you're doing math, it's worth the time to play, to, to play around with this. Uh, that's basically what I, I would say. You, MATLAB and Mathematica, you should think of them as like hammers and screwdrivers. Like you could hammer in a nail with the butt of your screwdriver, but it's a, not a really useful thing. And it's kind of the same here. Like you can do some of this math in MATLAB, but it's going to be a little bit more painful. And there's stuff you can do in MATLAB that you can do here, like image processing. That's going to be a bit more painful in Mathematica than it would be in MATLAB. And so it's, I think if you just think of this as a, tool to help your math. Um, 
like I don't do I do barely any like calculations without doing this side by side with Mathematica because I know that I make mistakes. Like I I know my the types of mistakes I make mathematically and I use this to help me not make those mistakes. So um, that was a super crash course. Play with this file, see if you can do any work on um, if anything finds it to be useful. I we're gonna do something in a minute that I'm gonna hopefully you do with me. Um, and I hope at that point um, you start to see that it can be useful pretty quickly for us here. Um, questions, I've been talking for forever. What questions do people have? Nothing? Is there like a partial derivative by function? Or like, a, or is there like a list somewhere within this that like has all the functions? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, how do you find what function you want to do? So, partial derivative functions. I'm trying to remember what the function is. So, the answer is yes, there is. I'm trying to remember what. How you do, how you how you do it? I have another. We have another, We will find out in this class because I have another mathematical notebook for um, when we have to deal with PDEs. Um, the bigger question you're asking is their help is remarkable. So, for instance, say you don't really understand plot, you can just kind of type in plot and hit I. And this is oops. And then their help is really incredible. For a couple of reasons, it's integrated. You can literally copy and paste like their examples and, and just kind of work off that, which is what I do most of the times. And then what you can do is you can start to see it'll you'll find other oh like what is this? Like what are these things? Okay, log plot, and you can start to go down a rabbit hole of um, oh wait. I need to figure out the, ex the exponential function. So there's got to be a function for exponential. The short answer to your question is usually what I do is if I need to do something and I'm not sure how to do it, I kind of Google it and you know, uh, almost immediately what pops up is this help site. And so um, the number of functions it has is truly immense. And so if you want to play, you can just go to the, the help thing and go to home and just see. I mean, there's integrated uh, machine learning components here. There's integrated image analysis. Uh, you can analyze sound waves. You can pull data from populations uh, onto here. You can do geography stuff where you're like importing like maps as vectors and, and um, I mean, you can see the list. Oh, you can't see the list. I'm looking at. I didn't realize that. Sorry. Hold on. Um, let me do this again. I didn't realize you couldn't see that. Sorry. I thought it was the same window. Here we go. So if you look at the the help file, the, this is just the home page for the documentation. Like you can see all of the ridiculously advanced stuff that you can do from analyzing text to analyzing sound to uh, doing you can do find an element analysis in here it's kind of pain but like it's, it's doable you can do data analysis machine learning um, I mean you can read but it's pretty it's pretty remarkable the things you can do with it so I would say if you like math um, you should play around with this. You'll have some fun with it. Like you can do some remarkable stuff. And there's tons of tutorials and tons of um, uh, other um, like YouTube videos and stuff. People people doing things. I'll have some Mathematica notebooks that'll be useful for us for this class. But yeah, it's we're barely scratching the surface by just doing some basic like you know we were doing this <laughs> you know and like maybe a little of. Did we do anything else? Yeah, I guess we did some of this. Like, you know, like you can see how, how immense this thing is. Um, I use it daily, so I don't know. 
that may or may not be a useful data point for you. Other questions? Make sure it's not in the chat. If we were for like on the homework to like have a long ass question yeah. know, and then just be like put in Mathematica and then write down the answer, would that be okay? It's totally fine. I've had students submit their Mathematica notebook because they want to do it all in there. I, I'm fine with it. I'm I'm like not at this stage in your career, like I'm not interested in you making algebraic errors or calculus errors for the sake of like some flex. Like just get the right answer. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like totally fine with me. Just tell me how you did it. You know, like if it, it, you, know, you can say, hey, I did this in Mathematica, or you can send me your Mathematica notebook, and that's fine. Both of them are fine. There's a learning curve to it, but I'm happy happy to help you walk through it. Yeah. I can like easily Google this, but like, how do I like let's say delete? Let's say I do two three lines and I'm like, oh, I don't need this anymore. Like how do I delete it? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so you would just kinda so let's see, what do I want to pick here? Uh, you basically can just you can do a couple things. You can grab your cursor like up here and just start dragging it down and you'll look what's happening on the right hand side of my screen. You can see the cells I've, I've highlighted on the on the right hand side there, the blue, and then you just hit delete, okay. undo. Or you can kind of go through and kind of manually on the right hand side select them. Um, whatever, it's, it's all up to you. You can also add. I, I should probably tell you this too. Like you can add in like a. I'm gonna make a new section heading here called um, uh, data fitting. So you can kind of format your notebook so that it's not just like a wall of math. Um, and then kind of come down and say, okay, in my first subsection of this thing is going to be um, uh, linear regressions. You know, like you can kind of format it to make it, this is more useful if you're like doing a bigger project or an assignment, you're trying not to lose track of stuff. Like I, I do this with, I usually open it up as like a scratch pad and then it's like, oh, actually, I, this is, might be working. And I start to format it so that way, you know, it's like commenting your code. If there's a learning curve, if you are envisioning yourself doing math frequently, you enjoy it. Or you're someone like me who makes tons of tiny mistakes uh, all the time, then I would I think it's worthwhile to um, to spend the time to to learn how to use it. Um, but you know, it's up to you. I think it'll definitely be useful for this class. So we're going to come back to it over and over again, especially as we work on some um, uh, solid mechanics type problems that are. A combination. The problem with solid mechanics and structural mechanics is you end up very quickly getting into problems that are differential equations of tensors. So you're kind of dealing with a pain in two ways. And so this can, can help alleviate uh, some of that. So, all right. If there's no questions, let's take a break until like 10.04, uh, and then we'll solve, we'll learn, we'll learn about snapping. I got another question. Yeah, what's up? In terms of the, you know, turning in homework that we think we messed up. Like, yeah. um, do you want us to like turn in the whole assignment or just like? I would love it course. if you're going to turn in your updated assignment. If you just, if the new one you submit is your whole assignment, yeah, that's so just it'll make my life easier. So I'm not jumping back and forth. So if, if you're going to submit something by tomorrow evening, just submit your whole thing. You can just copy and however you yeah. want to do it, you know. But I one file would make my life easier. Thank you.
Is the email okay? I am trying to make it as simple as possible, but I, I know that some classes have more complicated systems. So. Is there Not really. That would be like five, I guess, at midnight. I don't really care. Yeah, I'm not for sure. The end of the day, before the weekend. <laughs> so, I'm not going to. I'm not going to look at it at Friday night. So, anytime Friday night is. Probably, I'll probably not answer to this, but like you do accept like work, right? Like for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, obviously, it'll be a penalty. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm as I as I'll say over and over again. Like I, I need you, you all to learn this stuff, and so I'd rather the focus be on that. So. Gotcha. The link where audio put the music.
All right. Should we get back to it? <clears throat> um, I think everyone, because of mechanics of materials and because of how easy it is to visualize buckling instabilities, has some concept for buckling instabilities. As I mentioned, it's kind of one of the points of that review paper is for a long time, engineers review, view instabilities as something to be avoided. Snapping instabilities are a little different and, and they've been utilized as switches for a really long time. So if you've ever worked on a really old computer keyboard, like that kind of feeling you get when you push down the keys, it kind of feels like there's a, like there's a little mechanism there that is actually snapping underneath that uh, structure. Um, the toy popper that was talked about in the paper is another kind of example of a, of a, of a snap through instability. Um, they're used in a ton of contexts, but I found this video and I thought this was just kind of a fun intro because it's really very similar to the canonical snapping problem we're going to solve. Um, and it's something that's, as mentioned in the title of this video, is a device in probably every household uh, in the country. So I thought I would let uh, this guy explain it to you and then we'll go in and try to work on a similar, simpler problem. Hopefully you all can hear. Uh, hold on a second. The folks at home, can you hear the audio uh, when it plays from my video? Or no? Should I play it on this computer? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit? What if I put my microphone on here? This clever little device is found in everything from washing machines to power tools. In fact, if your tool is quiet enough, you can hear the characteristic clicking sound that it makes. Listen to my drill press, for example. And the air compressor with the bell removed. It's called a centrifugal switch. And I recently began having problems with this guy, which is something I've never experienced before. So today I want to show you how I repaired the problem. It was a very easy fix, actually. And I'll show you how it works, because this dude is pretty amazing. Let's take a look. So why do you need something like this to begin with? Well, the motor most commonly found in washers, dryers, and many power tools, in fact, requires a little kickstart in order to get going. In order to get the motor spinning, engineers will often use capacitors to give it that little kickstart. But you only want this thing connected to the motor for maybe a second or so, otherwise it will quite literally explode. Therefore, we need to connect the capacitor to the motor when it's not spinning, and as soon as it gets up to speed, we need to disconnect the motor, introducing the centrifugal switch. This amazing little device is so simple, it's just two springs and a weight. But as the motor spins up, these weights fling out and they open a circuit. So here we have the beginnings of our start winding. This switch right here is connected when you push it down. And as you can see, this red LED is blinking when I close the switch. Now I've only got three volts DC connected here, so there's no risk of being electrocuted or anything like that. So during normal operation, this would go in here. And as you can see, the circuit is now closed. Once you turn on the power to the motor, this start winding plus the main winding will both be connected to power. But remember, we only want this to be connected for maybe a half a second or so. Really, once the motor gets up to about 80, 90% of its rated speed. So what happens is as this guy starts to spin, these weights tend to want to fling out like this. This tendency of the weights to want to swing out is something you've experienced before. If you've ever ridden a roller coaster, in fact, if you've made a hard turn in a car and felt all of your body weight shift to one side of the car, that same force is what causes these weights to want to swing out away from the center. Now, here's what makes this device so clever. You want it to open at about 85, 90% of its rated speed because you want to make sure you've given it just enough kick without overheating the motor. But you also want it to snap closed very quickly. Otherwise, you'll be rubbing this for a long time and wearing out the starter winding. So these weights are carefully calibrated to open up at exactly the right speed make them just a little bit heavier and they open up at lower speeds, make them a little bit lighter, they open up at higher speeds. 
calibrate the spring to just the right amount so you get a nice, crisp, quick snap back into place. And you've got a clever little device that will open and close your motor and last for many years. Now that you've seen this, let me show it to you fully assembled inside the motor. You know, I have to say, beyond its simplicity, there's one more thing that's really impressive about this device to me, and that's how old it is. This simple mechanism is over 100 years old, and we still use it. We have not found a comparable replacement. Now, don't get me wrong. There are lots of electrical alternatives to this. We've come up with all kinds of ways to start motors. But what I'm saying is we still use this. This is still the most cost-effective way to start motors, and that's why we still find them in induction motors today. All right, that's a snapping mechanism. The force is the force being applied there is a bit more complicated than we want to play with at first. We'll actually work on a problem a little bit later, but we're going to use kind of that kind of centrifugal acceleration to calculate the force in another spinning object. Um, but for right now, what you can see is there's a couple of springs. When that force exceeds some critical value, those springs snap open, and then you're popped into contact. And so I want to give you uh, the ability, the tools needed to apply what we learned last class to figure out when this thing is going to snap. And to kind of show you the subtle differences between a snapping instability and a buckling instability. And so we're going to work on a similar problem, but just a, a little bit simpler. Come on. All right. So we're going to work on kind of the, the simplest possible snapping problem. And it looks like this. It looks like we're going to have a, two springs, just like we saw in that video. So a spring here. There's a pin here and a pin here. And a second spring over here. So these are all pinned. Doesn't really. Uh, these are kind of sitting on some simple supports. So two springs pinned together. Really simple. Just pinned together at some angle. They're pinned together at an initial angle. And we'll call that initial angle. is measured from the horizon, call it alpha, and we will say that when we push on this object, I guess why did I copy that? Um, when we push on this object, At the, at the apex, it's going to deflect. So that it's new angle. We can say that these springs have a spring constant 
Okay. And typically these types of things, the easy thing to uh, measure is kind of the, the horizontal span here. We'll call that L. Remember what we did last class. What we need to do is a couple of things. So the steps to solving this problem are step one, determine the total potential energy. And the total potential energy Uh, is composed of the strain energy stored in the springs and the potential of the external loads. I should, I'm going to write that as, let's see if I can write it as like a fancy P, which is equal to the negative of the work being done. Once you determine V, your second goal, step is to find the equilibrium equation. Which means take the partial derivative of V with respect to your degree of freedom. So in this problem, the degree of freedom is our angular rotation. Theta. Theta is what's changing. Set that equals zero. Solve for P as a function of your degree of freedom, as a function of theta. Your third step is check for stability. Which, revolve, which involves taking the second derivative of your total potential energy and verifying that it is greater than zero. To do this verification step, it's important to remember, and I don't think I said this explicitly, but so I'll say it now. What you're doing is you're evaluating the stability of the equilibrium condition you found. What that means is when you take the second derivative of your total potential energy, it's going to have your force in there. So what you're going to want to do is take the second derivative of your total potential energy, substitute in the force that you've already found. So I'll write that over here. So maybe the better order of operations would be to say, take the second variation or second derivative, sub in P, then check. that it's greater than zero. This is the generic plan for any, any stability problem. All right, let's get to work. Take a, take a second and see if you can determine what the strain energy uh, in this structure is.
Jesús. All right, so the strain energy should be one half strain, spring constant times the displacement of the spring. Now, the displacement of the spring requires you to find out what the original length of the spring is and take away from that original length the compressed length of the spring. I did some, drew some triangles here. Is how I thought of this problem, such that. Uh, the one on the right is your deformed case. I should draw that on there. And then the one on the left is your original case. So therefore, I would expect that my total strain energy is the combination of both of these. Now, they're the same. There's no difference. So you basically just have two times one of them. So you would say it's two times one half K. Now I need to take my displacement of my spring and square it. So my displacement of my spring is gonna be L over cos alpha minus L over cos theta, and then square that. And from these triangles, you can also get the, if we want to get the work, the work is going to be the force times the displacement. What's the displacement? Well, if the height of my, of my uh, spring thing is initially L tan theta, right? This is the initial height is L tan theta. My deformed height is going to be L tan, oh, shoot, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My initial height is L tan alpha, sorry. And my deformed height is L tan theta. So my deflection of that kind of top point, the point B, is going to be L tan alpha minus L tan of theta. So my work. <clears throat> My work is going to be L times the tangent of alpha minus the tangent of theta. We can kind of cancel out our two and our one half over here. So my total potential energy is going to be U, oops, it's going to be V is equal to U minus W, right? Because it's U plus your potential, which is your negative of your work. So it's U minus W. So at this point, you could probably see why I spent some time uh, asking us to learn some advanced mathematical program. Because what you have here is a really annoying nonlinear function in the denominator and then squared. You can definitely do these derivatives out. It'll take you a bit. Well, I shouldn't say that. It'll take me a bit. Um, there's also ways if you didn't have uh, 
a computer with you and you needed a quick estimate of what's happening here, you could um, uh, approximate these things. But you have to be very careful here. And this is where I make a point in the review paper that we read about, about buckling and snapping and the, and the buckling is, is nice to work with because you can apply linear stability analysis and snapping you can't. And what I mean by that is we could linearize these equations by taking the small angle approximation. And what would happen is you completely lose the instability. It goes away. It'll, it is in the linear stability analysis for buckling, what you lose is the post buckling behavior, right? You lose like what the shape of the buckled beam is, but it tells you the critical point. With snapping problems, you lose everything. And so this is why I say you have to be careful. So instead of approximating it, I thought it'd be useful for us to do this completely, do this, solve this problem. And to solve it, it's really useful for us to use Mathematica. So I'd get your computers out. And let's see if we can work on this together. So let me stop sharing here. And start sharing here. Okay. So our total potential energy is the strain energy minus the work. So my strain energy, if I can say V is equal to my strain energy. And we said our strain energy was Actually, you probably can't. Let me make this bigger for folks at home. Is that better? There we go. Our strain energy is K times, and I'm going to use control slash to give myself a fraction here. So control slash, that sets up an upstairs and a downstairs. Upstairs goes L, downstairs goes cos. It's capital, capital cosine. Um, and then square bracket alpha and remember out to get alpha it's escape a escape and we're going to subtract off of that control slash again it's l over cos and theta is escape you can type in theta or you can do escape q either one gets you the thing escape again square brackets. That whole quantity is squared. I think I forgot to tell you how to square something. The way you square something is you hit control and then where your caret key is on your keyboard. Usually it's a six. So control six should give you a little upstairs thing there. And then you can type in your, your number. I'm going to try to go slow here because I know this is your first time using this. We have to subtract off our work. Oops, I forgot something in our work. Uh, I just gave you the displacement. Um, well, I'll have to do it on here. Sorry, everyone. I'll, I'll fix them, I think. Your work is the force times the displacement. I just wrote down the displacement. So your work is going to be P times what we wrote down, which was L parentheses. And notice I'm always only using regular parentheses. Why is this thing here? Tangent of alpha minus tangent of theta close parentheses. People are good. People have this. You can see Mathematica already tried to simplify it for you and said, why are you writing one over cosine and a secant? So that's, it does that for us. So what do we do to calculate 
the equilibrium. Yeah, take the derivative. What are we taking the derivative with respect to? Theta, right? Because alpha is not changing. Alpha is just the initial parameter that's set by the by the shape of your geometry of your of your problem. So we're going to take the derivative, capital D, of V with respect to Q. Now, what we actually want to do to find equilibrium is we want to take the derivative of your total potential energy, set it equal to zero, and then solve for your force. Because what we'd like to be able to plot is force versus displacement or force versus angle of rotation. And so instead of doing it like this, what we can do is we can say, well, actually, I want to say the derivative of my thing should be double equal sign zero. That doesn't change much. And to find equilibrium, what we need to do is we need to solve this ugly equation for P. It's not too hard. We can say solve my derivative of my total potential energy with respect to theta is equal to zero and solve it for P. Now you can see that issue again that we had when we first used solve, which is one, it tucked your solution into a list, and two, it's got that annoying arrow thing. We know how to fix those. I need the first item on my list. Oh, I got an, it's actually in two lists, so I need the first item of my next list. And I want to replace P with what comes after the arrow. So I write P slash dot. And then I have my, my P there. Let me know if I'm going too fast uh, or if you're having trouble. One common mistake that people make is they forget to put a space between their variables. So for instance, if you accidentally didn't put a space between P and L, then when you try to take the derivative with respect to P, it's going to say there is no P. There's a PL, but I can't, you didn't ask me for that. So make sure if you're trying to multiply two things, you're actually putting a space between your variables. And again, make sure you're using the right parentheses where needed. How are people doing? Are people at this line? So this is what we want to, so this is, this is the answer to equilibrium, but it's actually not very useful, or I shouldn't say that. It's more useful if we can look at this. So I'm going to ask us to, I'm going to store this as a, as a variable. So I'm going to do one last step. I'm going to say, Equilibrium is that. And I'm going to plot my equilibrium from theta. Uh, oh, I can't plot this yet. Hold on. Um, hold on, hold on. What do I want to do? Okay. I'm going to plot my equilibrium and I'm going to normalize my force by K over L. Why am I doing this? It's because the curves are going to all look the same for whichever values of K and L I choose. They're just going to be shifted. So if instead I just divide by K and L, I'm getting what the master curve looks like for any spring stiffness and any L. If you're not comfortable with this, you can just put in values for, your, for K and L. So you can say, ah, I want K to be some made up value and L to be some made up value, but I'm gonna take my equilibrium and I'm gonna divide it by K and L. And let's pick an angle here. And I'm gonna replace in that equation, my angle alpha 
with a, some initial angle. I'm making this up. This is, I'll say it's pi over three. So it's something that's not, not like 45 degrees, like a little shallower than that. And I'm gonna plot this from theta is equal to, well, I don't know. I'm just gonna guess and then if I have to fix it, we'll fix it. We'll say negative pi over three. This might not work, we'll see. No, oh, perfect, it worked. So we'll go a little bit beyond that. So we'll go pi over two. Great. Okay, what on earth is this force displacement curve? Let me walk you through it. So first things first, let me show you your axes. So your x-axis is theta, and your y-axis is your force normalized by KL. Okay, so how do I read this plot? Well, you initially start here, where my mouse is. Why do I know we start there? What's that value? Well, that value is pi over three, 1.04. That looks like a 1.04 over here, right? So you initially start here, you start to increase your force. So you're increasing the value of P, which means you start to move this way and your angle is gonna decrease, right? Cause you're gonna start to compress this thing. It's gonna get shallower and shallower. And your force is going to go up, it's going to hit some maximum, and then it starts to go down. This right here is, corresponds to the point in which your springs are so compressed that they're exactly flat. That's the, the origin of that curve. If you keep pushing, it goes all the way through. So what you should be looking at, I don't know if you can see this, is your triangle is basically starting at pi over three, going up, the force goes up non-linearly, your triangle goes flat, and then your triangle goes smoothly to the other side. This is the force displacement curve. The one thing I want you to notice is in the buckling problem, there were two solutions. There was a solution in which the angle was zero, and then there was a solution for when the angle was not zero. In this problem, there is only one curve. We have one solution. If you look up there to our, our solution for equilibrium, it's just one thing. We only have one equilibrium solution. Those of you who played with snapping popper toys know, or I mean, I think I have one of these in here. So these little toy, these are little spherical shells. I can poke on them. They don't smoothly go from top to bottom. They snap, they jump. You can't see the jump here. It just looks like they smoothly go from triangle down, from going back and forth. But that's not what physically happens. How do we find what physically happens? To find what physically happens, we have to evaluate the stability of this equilibrium curve. Okay, so how do we do that? We first oops, take the second derivative of V with respect to theta Now you're starting to see why we're using Mathematica. That's horrendous. Now, amongst this awful thing, I want to point out that it's mostly K's and L's, a P, and then some angles, and then a bunch of nonlinear trig functions. We need to tell it that we actually already know P. We're going to replace P 
with my equilibrium solution. So this is just saying replace the force P in this equation with what we found for P up there. Not bad. And then we can ask it to simplify that. We can uh, just for visual niceness. Cool. That's not as awful. Why are we doing this? We need to check when the second variation or second derivative of original potential energy is positive, because that's the only time your equilibrium will be stable. So let's look over here. I'm going to copy my plot again. Uh, do I want to do that? No, yeah, yeah, OK. Um, I only have a minute left. Uh, let's see if I can do this quickly. Um, Uh, da, da. We'll just say k is equal to 1 and l is equal to 1. It doesn't matter. And we'll plot this alpha is equal to pi over. Oh, come on. Let's go to pi over 3. And we'll plot this from theta is the same thing. Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Sweet, that's 2. That's, that's awful. Uh, and we'll just plot this. It's pretty nonlinear, so we'll actually we'll just plot it from pi over 3 to pi over 3. Awesome. So, look. Our parabola is positive. So here's the point we start at. Here's the initial configuration. Your initial configuration is stable. And then at this point here, it becomes completely unstable. So what does it do? Uh, give me one second and I'll try to. Yes, awesome. So what does it do? You start here, you load your thing up into this point here, and then right here, you'll notice that your curve becomes unstable. This point here, everything to the left of this thing is unstable until you get to Here. So your curve starts So you load your, your, your spring structure, you get to the point where this thing becomes zero, and then it snaps. And what does it do? It jumps. You're maintaining a constant force, which means your force is fixed. You're, right now you have a force of like one. So what does it do? It jumps on that curve to wherever the, neck, the force is also one and your, curve is, and your stability curve is positive. So it jumps, stays horizontal because you're applying a fixed force. Jumps, 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 jumps over to here. Your spring does this. You're loading it, you're loading it, you're loading it. It hits some critical point and then it snaps. And where does it go? You're applying a fixed force P. So it just goes horizontally at that fixed force P, force P to wherever it finds the next stable point. Buckling, you have two equilibrium curves. At the critical point, you switch. The critical point is determined when the stability when the second derivative of your total potential energy becomes negative. Same with snapping, except that you have one curve and your instability jumps 
from wherever it's the at the load that you're applying to wherever that load is again stable. And on this curve, it's jumping horizontally from here, here, I guess, all the way over to here. If you were to take your upside down spring and push on it vertically this way, it'll follow all the way down to here and then jump back that way. I know we're over time. If we have questions about this, we can discuss them at the beginning of class next week, or you can send me an email. Uh, we, can, we can find time to chat. I know we rushed it, but hopefully you at least see the value in terms of using some of this stuff to make your math life a little easier and also to visualize what you're doing, which for me as someone who's a visual learner is really crucial. So, all right, thanks everybody. Have a nice weekend. If you wanna work on fixing up any of your problems, get them to me by tomorrow night. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you next, next week. Do we have class on Tuesday or is it? We don't, right? It's a holiday Monday. Yeah. So I won't see you all for a week. All right. Have a nice week.